Today we are looking at a case from the mid 20th century. So sit back as we go to England. Harry Dobkin was born in the East End of London in 1893, an area that in the late 19th century was known for its poor living conditions, overcrowding and associated social problems. Young Harry went to school, but like so many other children at the time, he left as soon as he was able and started to work. He obtained a position in the cloth trade, a long established industry that 300 years earlier had been responsible for 90% of England's exports. By the time Harry was employed in the trade, the British influence upon it had declined, but it was still considered important. In 1914, the First World War began and Harry was in London on the 13th of June 1917, when 14 German aircraft carried out a daylight raid over the city. 72 bombs were dropped within a one mile radius of Liverpool Street Station in the East End. 162 civilians were killed, including 18 infants, at Upper North Street School in Poplar. Harry saw the destruction, but he and his family remained unharmed. Following the war, the economy briefly recovered, and on the 5th of September 1920, Harry married a young lady named Rachel Dubinsky in the synagogue in Bethnal Green. Both Harry and Rachel were born into poor Russian immigrant families, and their marriage had been arranged by a Jewish marriage broker. They moved to a small flat near the White Chapel Road, but they did not seem to get along. Three days later, they separated. They did try to reconcile their differences, but their attempts were unsuccessful. However, soon afterwards, Rachel discovered that the brief period that she had been with her husband had resulted in her becoming pregnant. She gave birth to a baby boy in September 1921. Harry continued to work. For a while, he worked on the ocean liners and travelled to New York, and for a short time he lived in the United States. But he soon returned to England and took over from his father selling aprons and tea towels in the London markets. Although a good worker, he was not forthcoming with the maintenance payments. Since Victorian times, the court had the power to ensure that an absent father paid maintenance for their children. Harry had been ordered to pay the weekly sum of 10 shillings and had been instructed to leave the money every Monday at the Old Street Police Courts. However, he often neglected to do so, which resulted in him spending some months in prison. The non-payment of maintenance upset Rachel and whenever she questioned her estranged husband about it, he would always become aggressive. He was a strong and well-built man and his size intimidated her. She had reported him to the police and had attempted to have him charged for assault. Her attempts, however, had been unsuccessful. In 1939, the Second World War began and although Harry tried to continue with his small business selling tea towels and aprons, there was not enough trade to enable him to make very much money. So instead, he started to work as a fire watcher there had been a need for fire watchers since September 1940, when the German Luftwaffe started dropping bombs and incendiary devices on London. On Sunday the 29th of December, so many bombs and parachute mines were dropped that by the early evening, the city was in flames. It was described as the second great fire of London. The Prime Minister Winston Churchill was anxious that St Paul's Cathedral should be protected, not only because it contained many great works of art, but also because its presence in the London skyline was a great boost to the morale of the people. He instructed that fire watchers were employed to look out for the fires across the city. Harry worked in a building owned by a firm of solicitors on the Vauxhall Road in Kennington. By now it was 1941 and Harry's son was 19 years old. No longer a child, but Harry was still expected to pay his maintenance payments, something that he always seemed reluctant to do. On the 11th of April 1941, Rachel travelled the short distance from her home at 44 Cookham Buildings to meet Harry at a cafe in Kingsland Road in Shoreditch. They were not on good terms, but Rachel had been going every week to the Old Street Police Court, and whenever Harry had not paid the maintenance money, she would always harass him. However, on this particular occasion, she did not return home. Her sister, named Miss Polly Dubinsky, became very concerned and reported her missing. She told the police that Rachel had gone to meet her estranged husband and that no one had heard from her since. The police were not particularly interested in investigating the disappearance. But when Mrs Rachel Dobkin's handbag and identity card turned up 30 miles away at a post office in Guildford 
they decided to visit Mr Harry Dobkin. He lived with his parents at 21 Navarino Road in East Dalston. He told the officers that he had met Rachel on the 11th of April at a cafe on the Kingsland Road in Shoreditch, but she had left in the early evening at around 6.20. He said that he saw her board the bus. He added, but even after 20 years apart, she still wanted to reconcile with him. He said that Rachel was unstable and could have just wandered off, as she had done this previously and she was eventually found in St Clement's Hospital in Bow. He told the officers that on that occasion, the doctors had advised him and her sister that Rachel had been suffering from memory loss. Harry added that he thought that she was seeing someone else. The police were under immense pressure. The bombing raids over London were intense and it was difficult for them to investigate every missing person, especially one who had gone missing previously and then turned up again. On the 17th of July, 1942, workmen were clearing the Vauxhall Baptist Church in Vauxhall Road in Kennington. It had been partially destroyed by a bomb nearly two years earlier, on the 15th of October, 1940, and this had resulted in the deaths of more than 100 people. It had been struck again in March, 1941. The chapel had been a place of worship for many years, but had not been used since the late 1900s. As the workers pulled up a heavy stone slab, they discovered the remains of a badly burnt body. This was not uncommon. They frequently came across bodies in their daily routine of clearing the buildings that had been ruined by bombs. They presumed that this poor soul was just another victim who had died in one of the bombing raids over London. However, they had to follow the familiar process when an identified body was found. So they called the police who removed the body and transported it to Southwark Mortuary. The pathologist was named Dr Keith Simpson and on examining the skeletal remains, he began to realise that something did not look quite right. The skull had become detached and it looked as though the head had been cut from the body. He also discovered that the limbs had been severed at the elbows and the knees and the skin had been removed from the face. It was apparent that someone had tried to hide the identity of the deceased. The lower jaw was missing but the upper jaw was intact and contained four teeth, all of which had fillings. When he looked at the voice box, he noticed a tiny bone fracture, which gave the distinct indication that this was not a bomb victim, but a person who had died from strangulation. Dr. Simpson requested permission from the coroner to transport the body to Guy's hospital, where he had the facilities available to enable him to undertake a more thorough examination. He also visited the Vauxhall Baptist Chapel in Kennington, and asked to be shown the exact location where the body had been found. He wanted to see if he could locate any of the missing limbs. However, he noticed something that he thought could be far more significant. In the empty space where the body once lay, he saw that the earth was a strange yellow colour. He took some samples back to his laboratory to be analysed, and as he suspected, the yellow substance was lime. By now, Dr Simpson was sure that the body was someone who had been murdered and deliberately placed in the church, not an unfortunate victim of the bombing. However, the body had been coated in builder's lime, which unlike quicklime, does not decompose the body. Instead, it actually preserves it. He had already ascertained that the victim was female, around 40 or 50 years old, and about five foot tall. And interestingly, she had suffered from an untreated fibroid tumor. Dr. Simpson estimated that the victim had been killed and placed in the chapel sometime between April and July of the previous year. So what had originally been thought of as an inquiry to try and find out the identity of a bomb victim had now become a murder investigation. Detective Hatton began to check the missing persons records and contacted hospitals to try and find out if any of their patients had been diagnosed with a fibroid tumor that had not been treated. Missing persons records were looked at and one seemed to be of particular interest, Mrs. Rachel Dobkin, the estranged wife of Mr. Harry Dobkin. She had last been seen on the 11th of April, 1941. It was her sister Polly who had originally reported Rachel missing. She had been concerned as she knew that her sister and her estranged husband had never got along. The police had interviewed Rachel's husband, Mr. Harry Dobkin, but without a body, they were unable to look further into Miss Polly Dobinsky's concerns. They did contact her when unidentified bodies were found, but none had turned out to be her sister. There was some speculation that Rachel may have succumbed to a bomb, possibly not being able to get herself into a shelter soon enough. 
but Polly had always insisted that Harry Dobkin was responsible for her sister's mysterious disappearance. She had contacted a firm of solicitors in January 1942 and instructed them to write to the police to ask them to contact him again. The police, however, had been far too busy to look into her claims. This time, however, things were different. There was an unidentified body that fitted the description of Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. The pathologist believed that the person who had been found in the chapel had died at the same time that Polly Dubinsky had reported her sister as missing. She was the same height and was in the age range of the body found in the Vauxhall Baptist Chapel. Miss Polly Dubinsky gave the police the name of her sister's dentist, Dr. Barnett Coppin, who operated from a practice in Stoke Newington. Fortunately, he kept meticulous records. He remembered Rachel, and when he was shown the dental charts, he was pretty sure they were hers. When he checked, they were a perfect match. Miss Dubinsky also told the police that her sister had suffered from an untreated fibroid tumour. The detectives investigated Harry Dobkin. They discovered that three days after his wife had gone missing, he was on duty in his position as a fire watcher on the Vauxhall Road when a small fire had broken out in the cellar of the Baptist Church. This was strange, as not only had the church already suffered greatly from bomb damage, there'd been no air raid that night, and there was no reason for Harry Dobkin to have been there. He had not reported the fire to the fire warden, and it was only because a man who was walking along the road near the building spotted the fire and alerted a passing police officer that the fire was ever documented. The following night, there was a serious and intense air raid which had resulted in many fires across the capital. The small fire in the cellar of the church in the Vauxhall Road was soon forgotten. So it looked as though the police had identified the victim, but just to be certain, Miss Mary Newman, who was in charge of the photography department at Guy's Hospital, used the same technique pioneered by Professor John Glaister to identify Isabella Ruxton and Mary Jane Robinson in 1935 and superimposed a photograph of the skull onto a photograph of Rachel Dobkin. The fit was perfect. It seemed that Harry Dobkin had indeed murdered his wife and taken her body to the Vauxhall Baptist Chapel, where he covered it with builder's lime and set fire to it. He knew that the body would eventually be found, but presumed that when that happened, she would be unrecognisable and probably just dismissed as a victim of the bombing. On the 26th of August 1942, the detectives interviewed Mr Harry Dobkin. He denied that he had anything to do with Rachel's disappearance or her death. He told detectives that he did not believe that the body was actually her. He had been interviewed previously by the police, but then they did not have a body or any physical evidence that anything untoward had happened to his estranged wife. Two days later, on the 28th of August 1942, Mr Harry Dobkin was arrested and charged with the murder of Mrs Rachel Dobkin. The trial of Harry Dobkin began on the 17th of November 1942 at the Old Bailey. The prosecution told the court that the defendant had committed this terrible act and used the bombing and the chaos that it caused in London to cover his crime. They said that he knew there were many tragedies caused by the air raids and that it was very difficult for the police to investigate every body that was found dead in the rubble. They reminded the court that the defendant was a strong, aggressive man and the victim was a small, defenceless lady who only ever asked for the maintenance support that she was entitled to. They insisted that the evidence proved that Mr Harry Dobkin had murdered his wife, dismembered her body and attempted to burn it in the cellar of the already bombed Vauxhall Baptist Chapel. They added that the chapel was next to the building where Mr Dobkin worked as a fire warden. Dr Simpson was called as a witness and explained to the court how he had managed to identify the victim and ascertain when and how she had died. The defence disputed this evidence and maintained that the body found in the church was not that of Mrs Rachel Dobkin. The evidence, however, was quite conclusive and when the trial ended, the jury took just 20 minutes to find Mr Harry Dobkin guilty of murder and the judge sentenced him to death. On hearing the verdict and the sentence, Mr Dobkin said, the charge against me is very poorly invented. I do not like giving evidence against the police, but I claim this charge of murder, as I have mentioned, is simply invented. The defence appealed against a sentence, but their appeal was dismissed. Harry Dobkin eventually confessed to the murder. He said he needed his wife out of the way, as she was always harassing him for the maintenance payments. 
Harry Dobkin was hanged at Wandsworth Prison in London on the 26th of January 1943. Hello everyone and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case. <laughs>